Welcome back, everyone. Uh, a short but uh, no doubt excellent coffee break, and we're going to press on because we have so much information that we want to share with you. So we're going to continue the conversation uh, from the air gas story because to take us up to lunch now, some fascinating insights into how organizations are transforming through e-commerce. And we're talking big transformations from adapting processes to adding new skills in the organization. This session will tackle one of the most asked questions today, which is how do we adapt our organization and actually profit from e-commerce? So what I'm going to do is one by one, welcome up our panel, hold your applause till the end if you will. Uh, from Dusan, we have Brian Deal. From Stanley Black & Decker, we have Mark Fruling. From Ingram Micro Mobility, we have Jeremy Rogers. Welcome. From MSA, we have Susie Sapsara. Nice to see you. And from Purchasing Power, Scott Wheeler. Welcome, welcome, and a round of applause. Thank you. All right, so you've all got some uh, mics very close to you. What I'd like to do is what I always like to do, which is ask you to introduce yourself to this wonderful audience. Tell us a bit about you and your business. And Brian, I'm going to throw it all the way over to you. Sure. Uh, Brian Deal from Doosan. Uh, Bobcat Construction Equipment is better known, uh, especially in North America. So our focus, uh, my focus is on our dealer channel and the tools and technologies that we use to deliver service out to the channel, much like Steve spoke to earlier, uh, similar network, similar construct in delivering e-business. And where would you say you are on the journey? Journey-wise, we're in a tech refresh. So we had first-generation tools that were quite effective, uh, but now we're, we're working to look at our processes again, look at our data. Uh, we've got an ERP project that's underway. So we're taking this opportunity really to step it up a notch and refresh. Very nice. Thank you and welcome. Mark Fruling, you're next. Sure. I'm Mark Fruling. I work in IT. I'm in the construction and do-it-yourself division at Stanley Black & Decker. So that's the global power tools and hand tools division. Um, the state that we're in now, we kind of in a tech refresh too. We had our first version of product information and B2B uh, e-commerce sites. And they was, were all custom built internally, aging five to ten years old. And now we're standing all those up on Hybris, uh, looking to go live at the end of this month. All right, thank you. That's great. Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy Rogers, Ingram Micromobility. I've been with the company for almost 12 years. Uh, we provide device lifecycle services for large carriers, manufacturers, and retailers in the wireless industry. Um, in terms of maturity, um, we're fairly stable right now. We've been on our current platform for over three years now. Um, we've been in the B2B commerce space for about 11 years in total. All right, so you've been there and seen it and done it to an extent. Susie, you're next. Uh, Susie Sapsera, I'm the Global E-Business Manager for MSA. Um, we are uh, just finished up uh, complete replatforming, launching 40 websites in 20 languages. Um, one uh, e-commerce installation in all of those sites, but um, ex going to be expanding outside of the US uh, in early 2014. All right, thank you, and you're very welcome. And uh, finally, Scott Wheeler. Hi, I'm Scott Wheeler. I'm the CEO of Purchasing Power, and we're a, uh, an e-tailer um, who sells a program into an employer. So we're a little bit of a, uh, of a hybrid B2B2C concept, selling a program into an employer that allows their employees to buy uh, large ticket uh, products and services, but pay for those tick, you know, excuse me, pay for those items through a payroll deduction process over 12 months. Oh, that's pretty. That's pretty inventive yeah. and creative. Yep. All right, great. Welcome to all of you. We'll do the same thing as we did last time. I've got a selection of questions for our wonderful panel. Then we'll open it to your questions from your devices, and they'll flood into my iPad, and I'll ask as many as I can get through. All right. I'm always fascinated by how things begin, so I'd like to really begin with that. The, the blank piece of paper, I asked Steve a very similar question. How did it start within your organizations? What were the first couple of steps you took? Were they the right steps, or did you make a huge error? Uh, a random start. Who would like to kick us off? Go for it, Jeremy. Sure, so thinking back it's been over 10 years ago, um, we really had no e-commerce technology at the time. It was actually pretty easy because we had a couple of large customers that issued some pretty deep RFPs that had core requirements around e-commerce. So our hands were tied. We either had to invest or lose the business. So right. at that point, it was uh, the business case was very easy. It was just satisfying these customers um, and then prioritizing from there um, what the quick wins could be for internal processes. So that to an extent, your hand was forced did you go about it the right way? 
Um, we made mistakes, but we failed fast typically. Um, we've replatformed multiple times since then, um, but those customers were happy. We still have them on board today, so I think in the end it was successful. You didn't lose the customers, but you at least were fast, you were rapid in terms of your response to what you saw as a failure. Absolutely. All right, that's good, good knowledge. Um, Brian, why don't I throw it to you? How did it start? Sure, we came off an ERP launch 10 plus years ago, Look at the, looked at the fax machine, and saw the opportunities of, of how we could bring the business through. And we also had some pressures, competitive pressure, uh, as well as customers, large customers, looking for something more. Uh, some quality issues where we knew we could improve. So really organically started with you know, process improvement and how we could automate some of these first processes uh, within our organization. From that perspective, we started uh, in our aftermarket business where we had a pretty good handle on it. Uh, we thought we understood our processes, we didn't. Right. Um, but we went through it in that regard, started small, and then kind of scaled it out. So step by step was really a key to success for you? Absolutely. Any huge errors at the start? Lots of errors, lots of blood, lots of pain. <laughs> That's the only way it should be. Yeah, no, I, I think with, with this, um, we we're very narrow in, you know, paving the cow path, you know, automating very strictly what we thought was the transaction. And that's, I think, where we might have had a misstep early on, is, is not thinking broadly enough, right. not involving a large enough team, uh, and but not look... I'm sorry to interrupt you. I guess when you are at that starting position, you can't think broadly. You just want to grab a small win with a small team with a small idea. Yeah, but the stakeholder side of that and the management of it and the, the knock-on effect of what these processes, you know, everything has to change. So it's, you're, you're really forced to go village to village, kind right. of fighting these issues and battles. All right, that nice analogy. Scott Wheeler, similar story from Purchasing Power? Yeah, I think for us, it, it, it really was, uh, you know, putting a uniform on. I mean, we, we, didn't, we didn't have a great e-commerce presence. We had a homegrown website uh, struggling, literally, uh, our product content, we were loading through Excel spreadsheets. And a, a business that's growing 30% a year, about a $250 million business now, and we've only been around for 11 years. So we've grown very fast. Uh, we looked at it and said, for us to survive and us to continue to grow and scale, something we had to do. So the business case was actually fairly easy. Um, you know, you can't play baseball without a glove. You don't have a glove, you're not playing. And, uh, you know, getting over that hump wasn't the challenge because we knew we had to have a uniform and we had to have a glove. Uh, you know, trials and tribulations, yeah, I think everybody, if you've done these projects, you know what's, you know what's ahead of you. Right. You, you get through them and then you move forward. So Susie and Mark, uh, everyone else, really, the story is very similar. It's a case of it was a no-brainer. This was something we had to do. I think for us, for sure, from the executive perspective, the sell wasn't hard. Um, right. it you mean was, from you to them? Yes, that was easy. <laughs> the the diff, I think the, a, a lot of uh, people at that level are thinking it's you know it's a cost of doing business. We have to do this. Right. Um, I think for us, the challenge for the e-commerce piece um, to talk a little bit about what Steve uh, mentioned was the engagement with all of the key stakeholders across the organization. So the C-levels were saying, we have to do this, that's fine, go, go do it. We had an existing um, uh, partner commerce system in place, and I think the mistake, the biggest mistake we made was not doing uh, the hard work that Steve's doing, and that is kind of going back to those key stakeholders and back to our customers and saying, what is it exactly that you need, and instead of just rebuilding kind of what we had. All right, great insight. Thank you, Mark. You're last up on this question. Uh, for us, it was about building a business case around the, the tech refresh. If you already have a B2B site and you already have a product content system, why not just stay on this system that's 10 years old? It's at a higher level of leadership. It's doing the thing that it should do. As a manufacturer, saying e-commerce is a, a bit of a loaded word. We have significant channel conflict with people like Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, so kind of separating B2B and B2C e-commerce isn't always easy at the highest level. So um, what we did was we just built a business case around um, creating product and promotional awareness on the B2B site, which the, the current one lacked, um, and making sure that we could do brand stretch. We have five brands on that B2B site, 
but uh, we could show in the sales results that most of our customers were siloed into one of our professional brands, the DeWalt brand. Um, so that kind of helped us build our business case that we could stretch some of those orders that were already being placed into the other brands and you need product content, you need search, you need browse. So that kind of gave us the business case for kicking out our old system, bringing in a new. Now, a question to all of you on, on the subject, really, of the, the great quandary that we all face, which is the business case and then the ROI. Very often, you know, we bow to the pressure from the top, from the, from the customer, we implement, and then we're not making money. The ROI does not look good. How do we set our C-suite up for this initial disappointment? Because it may well come. I mean, I, I can take that. I mean, for us, it was, it was incremental. You know, I mean, if, 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 not going with a big bang kind of a solution, doing incremental progress and delivery, which allowed you to prove, prove the case, so to speak. Right. So we started out with PCM. Uh, that was our biggest pain point, and, and it reflected on our customer. We've gone in the last year from 2,500 items in, or 2,500 SKUs up to what will, for this holiday season, be 10,000. So wow. wouldn't have been able to do that without having, uh, you know, something that was was scalable. So um, do, uh, for the rest of you, did you get pressure from the C-suite that this must be profitable? We, we need to see the return immediately. No. Yeah, it's interesting. I just um, had this discussion with our CEO, and um, he was asking me, how are we doing against, you know, our benchmarks for the beginning of this project? And um, one thing I probably wouldn't do again is, you know, a lot of the justification, of course, we had to put some behind the project. Um, a lot of the justification was around efficiencies and elimination of other platforms right. and, you know, um, organizational efficiencies. And those are really very difficult to measure, especially across a global organization um, like ours. So uh, we did have some people um, throw some numbers about incremental revenue and things like that, but no real commitment behind it. So I think, you know, my answer was just that, you know, we have realized some of these efficiencies, but some I really can't tell if we have or not, and he didn't really believe in the incremental revenue numbers. Anyway, he didn't believe so. in anyway. So your CEO was <laughs> happy with the answer. I don't really know. Yes, but that's he's good. But 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 that pressure is not going to go away. So right. it's sort of like a buy because we were in a year and. I would love to know from each of you uh, a couple of tips for this audience on how you build the case internally. So you're going to go to your CFO or your CEO, you're, you're putting the case together, uh, the business case for B2B e-commerce. What needs to be in that pitch? Because that's what it is. Brian? Yeah, I think you start with something very tangible, something that they know and understand, which is the pain points of the organization, where we're letting customers down. Everybody knows those elements and you focus on that and how you're going to directly address those pieces. And before you get into the larger, you know, opportunities, keep it simple, keep it small and focused on, on those things that will have a tangible, very meaningful uh, measurement in the end. All right, nice ideas. Thank you. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, I think one of the things for us in our B2B portal, our sales reps are using it, our commercial sales uh, channel reps. So there's a bit of a mobility play there too, that they can have their iPad out in the field, place the order, have the conversation with the customer. Mm -hmm. So that kind of deflects a true numbers discussion. Um, and there's a lot of requests that have come in through our requirements phase that you, there's a very fine line between what the B2B portal is for a customer and some of the mobility requests that'll come in from the sales channel. So when you throw mobility into the mix, you get a bit of buy-in just for the convenience. I, I do. I think that you know, at the highest levels, they understand that that's a, a fixed cost of doing business at this point, and how can we become more mobile? Even if it's the perception out in the sales channel that we're doing something right internally to, to better serve the customer. Um, so I think there is perception there that they're willing to invest in. Lovely. Uh, Jeremy, what else should go into the mix when we're pitching to the business? Yeah, I would say if you can, try to chunk up the capital spend. Don't try to build a monolith because the perception is that you're building a big project when in reality you're never done. You're going to continue to invest and reinvest right. over and over again. So begin with that mentality up front if you can. So you, you, you're bracing them really for what is an, a non-ending investment cycle. True, but you're also setting expectations. So if you have, if you have goals tied with each phase, it's more measurable. Right. You can find quick wins. Okay, that's great advice. Thank you. Susie, it's up to you now. 
I think it's speaking their language, really. In, in my, um, in, at MSA, we're a very product development focused organization. That's what we do. We build safety products and, and you know, most of the executive level team, many of them were engineers or, right. you know, came from that background. So a uh, big part of my pitch was really using the same tools that they were used to seeing for a new product development project or something, uh, the same financial models, all of that, and kind of making this fit into that. And I think that makes so much sense because if you speak the language of the business, there's that much more credibility right from the start. And then everything else slots just that little bit easier. Scott, have you heard anything that you disagree with or anything you'd like to add? No, I, I think freeing up the business is something that we talk about. Uh, a lot of, the, a lot of the, uh, the process previous to our implementation, we had to go through technology. So technology became a big bottleneck. Um, so you know, being able to free the business up to, to own their own piece of it, uh, was important. You know, there comes responsibility with that, which is a, a different struggle as well. Of course, that never goes away. Um, you may ask your questions. This is a panel of people who have been there, done it, seen it, and are still on the journey, of course, because as we've already heard, the journey never ends. Just to remind you how you do it, we might bring it up on the screen. Uh, the text message number is 22333, and you have to proceed your question with that code 590. 408. You probably know all this by now, but I just wanted to remind you. Send in your questions. I'll have a look at them in just a moment. Okay, next question from me. Let's talk customers. What have you guys done to introduce this uh, new approach, this new concept to your customers and bring them along with you? And how far do you agree that the, the job is being done by the B2C side so the education is already there? What, what would you like to add to this conversation? Susie, yeah. <laughs> um, we actually uh, had, a, we, we looked at our existing um, e-commerce system, which really was um, just kind of a front-end order interface to SAP, which is our ERP system, and um, took the power users of that, and also some, uh, after we did some customer segmentation, um, and looked at people who could really benefit from this new platform. and took a chunk of those people and introduced them to it, really by hand and kind of, you know. You just, reached out individually? How did that happen? Yes. I mean, and these people have close relationships with us, and I had known them for from years at MSA, so they were happy to, to know that we cared enough to reach out to them specifically and get their feedback. So that, that was helpful in that initial phase. And I'm sorry to dig on this one, but I, I like it. I like the approach you took. It's fairly labor intensive. What was the response you got from those customers when they saw what you were trying to do or when you were consulting with them? They were very enthusiastic. In fact, after you know that initial introduction, we had other um, partners that heard we were doing something and were offering, you know, can we volunteer to, to test it out and give you our feedback as well. So it was a good way to engage them. Excellent. What else have you guys done to bring the customers with you? Yeah, I would say for us, you know, consumerization certainly drives a lot of the user experience, but in terms of B2B functionality, we do a lot of active customer listening. So in terms of loyalty surveys, transactional surveys, and the named relationships they have. We try to gather that input because really they know what, what they need to do in their business. Most of our customers that use our channel are independent retailers, so they have a very specific need. So we want to satisfy that whenever we can. All right, that's great, thank you. Any other points on this, Brian? Just from a customer perspective, when you, when you go out and we, we do a lot of talking to our dealerships, um, you have to embrace what they're saying. I'll give you an example. We have bulk order uploads and Things that are not very sexy, uh, not very B2C, but it's what they use and what they need to operate. And so to be willing to resist the urge to give them what you think they want and give them what they want. Uh, and a lot of times that's actually more towards the data side. And that's an area where we're always working to improve, is giving them more and more rich information to, to run and operate. So this is never going to be something that you set up and leave. This is not a, um, a just lock it and, and, and walk away. It's constantly being fine-tuned and changed. And that, that piece of communication with the customers, your belief is it's vital. Any other points on how we have brought the customers with us before we move on? No? All right, good. OK, so we have questions coming in from, uh, from the floor. Here's a very direct one. I, I don't know how many of you can answer this or will answer this, but you can give me a band if you feel more comfortable. What percentage of your business currently comes from e-commerce? Reach for a mic if you'd like to share. I'd say we're 95 
to 99%. I mean, wow. we do not take orders aside from certain government accounts and things like that. Our business is almost fully online. And, and prior, forgive my, my lack of understanding if I'm missing it, prior to switching it on, you were 100% you were um, direct. There was no B2B at all. Going back years and years, I guess, yeah, we, I mean, we've been at it a, a quite some time, 99 forward. So okay. we had some, some basic tools then. But All right, that's great. Thank you. Any, anyone else want to share the percentage? Yeah, so about 75% for us. Okay, that's very strong. Uh, for us, I'd say it's 10 to 15 percent. And what's your target? Um, that's a great question. I, I don't necessarily think our leadership is driving a target there. Uh, customer service is incentivized to make sure that uh, they'll drive less calls into the call center if a customer knows how to help themselves in that matter. But inside our, our commercial channel, there's still very much a need for a sales rep to talk to a customer to drive an order. So it, it's more about empowering either the sales rep or the customer to do the things that they want to do uh, online and still allowing, you know, not measuring on a number whether we've driven an order online or whether it's come through a sales rep. It's really all, all part of that, the same purpose. All right. Next question relates to an extent with our ROI discussion. Uh, what are the specific metrics uh, to measure the successful implementation of e-commerce within your organization? Are there any metrics that you can tell us about that help you measure success? We look a lot at retention, uh, customer loyalty, average order value, um, metrics around that. Um, not so much top line revenue, but sort of the metrics on specific order level. And do you ever see anything that surprises you and that uh, forces you to change direction or change in approach? We do. We've seen um, slight functional tweaks that have affected uh, average order value, um, attach rates for certain orders that we were surprised by. We had to go back and really dig deeper into why those trends were occurring and right. attack accordingly. Other answers on metrics? Uh, for us, it's, it's brand stretch, making sure that people are, it's easy to do business with us and purchase all of our brands. Our, uh, our president of sales always says that for every guy using a drill, he has a tape measure on his belt, and that should be a Stanley tape measure. So if you're ordering a drill and you don't order a tape measure, that's our fault. Um, so I think that's one of the biggest measurements, and that we're a new products company. So new products in our promotions every quarter, the awareness of those. Um, right now, our sales reps are emailing those or, or trying to get there in person, and there's just not enough people to give the coverage. So as long as we can prove that customers are aware of the new products, they're aware of the promotions, that'll help create the demand for the sale one way or another. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. All right, next question. Uh, how This is assuming you did. How did you include CRM platforms in your journey? How did you draw lines between CRM, ERP, and e-commerce? Mark, I see you nodding sagely. Uh, well, for us, we use Salesforce uh, as our CRM. And I do see uh, requests coming in. We're not quite there yet, but on the roadmap, um, salespeople would like everything all in one place. And it's, it's difficult to um, educate on, on why there are different pieces of software or different things to do that. So it's going to be one of our challenges in, in the coming years. Is, is how to allow those systems to integrate seamlessly. Um, so I can't say I have any experience in that at the moment, but it's definitely on our radar a, as, um, as an issue to address. All right, thank you very much. Any other comments on the, uh, the CRM question? You said CRM, ERP, and, and e yeah, it's like a Bermuda Triangle right there. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's the crux of it for, for a lot of us, right, is trying to figure out the rules of each of our platforms and, and how to maximize what they're intended to do uh, and who's the master of, of each domain when those systems sometimes are owned by different domains within the organization. So we continue to, to work through it. Um, we're Salesforce as well and we're continuing to look at how we can tie in and integrate the, the e-business side to that uh, and then ERP wise really try to make sure that we manage the performance uh, on the commerce side with, with as little dependency ERP-wise from integrations, et cetera. All right, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Susie, the next question is directly for you. Yeah. Susie, comma, at MSA, give us a sense for what type of resource, excuse me, resources it takes to deploy across 20 languages. Is 20 the right number? It's too many. <laughs> And we, um, you know, uh, just 
like many uh, departments and other organizations, you know, we're definitely resource strapped. Um, and it's challenging because uh, I have part of my team in Europe and part of my team in, uh, in the US. Um, there's only about six of us. Um, and mainly uh, our function is, you know, kind of translating requests that we get back and forth from, not literally translating them because we don't speak 20 languages, unfortunately. No, I don't know Chinese. Um, it is. I'm sorry. But, um, but just, you know, we get requests. Most of uh, the people that we interact with speak English um, within MSA, but we take those requests in and then have to literally figure out what they mean. So it's just very time consuming. Um, when we moved commerce outside of the US, um, I, I'm thinking that we'll have to think a little bit harder about those resources. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. Next question, and I think I'm going to throw this to Mark, actually. Uh, at least you can start us off. What is a reasonable time frame for generating rich content, say, for a thousand SKUs? Sure. Well, uh, I'm kind of right in the middle of that right now. Uh, or my, I should say my team is back at home. I noticed a little loosening of the collar there. Yeah. <laughs> um, product content management, I think, uh, just assume you're going to underestimate it. You know, I thought I didn't underestimate it, and I did underestimate it. Um, I think the number of SKUs is one variable, but um, it's not the most it's not the most complex. So I'd say the number of categories and the specific attributes you have around those categories, um, the number of systems you're migrating data from. That could be spreadsheets, uh, could be um, you know we have some ac acquisitions, so we had different uh, systems that we had to migrate it from, and I think both of those things, categories and systems was a multiplier on the time that it would take to get that data migrated. And then the, the third thing that I can remember through the project is when we created our taxonomy um, of how our products were going to be laid out, uh, a small decisions there about flattening that out or combining categories could really create weeks worth of calendar time meetings with the business and product managers to okay how those uh, products would be clubbed together and attributes would be split across those categories. So it's enormously time consuming, even though once you have that information, the data load, you know, the technical part of it isn't that much of a challenge. But actually getting to um, a, a taxonomy that you can then migrate to is a very big challenge. Right. So for a thousand SKUs, I would say um, loading those up is a day or two. If you have a hundred categories inside of that and ten product managers controlling those categories, then you have to assume that you have some sort of sign-off from each product manager and probably some debates with multiple product managers in a room. So that could easily consume you know, two to three months in calendar time. Goodness me. Are there any shortcuts? Um, what, what ideas could you give this audience on how you have handled this hugely complex area of dealing with all of these SKUs? I'd say keep it simple. I mean, we went from 2,500 to 10,000, um, and if we would have look within the product catalog and said, okay, here's all my, my, my facets and variables and images and content and everything else that we could use. Um, we may have gotten it converted and grown it, but managing it is a different story. So realize that on the other side of that, you've got to manage that. And if you don't manage it, you know, your customer will see that. So I would say keep it simple, start simple, and then grow it from there. Okay, wise words. Some would say easier said than done, but still, Susie? Um, a lot of what you were mentioning, I was sitting here going, yes, shaking my head. Um, and when you consider what he talked about across, you know, uh, several different product managers, and then you take that times 40 different regions, um, because in our case, not every um, region sells or country sells the same products. So we have kind of effectively different product catalogs and different products for every um, country that we have a site for. Um, I think for us, the key was just very good governance. Um, just defining who owns the decisions at a global level or at a, at a product um, hierarchy level, and then just really sticking to it. All right, thank you. Yes. I think one of the things that I, I would have done differently is education up front. Um, the business side, our, our customers really don't have education, sophisticated product content management, and 
even what a taxonomy is and what that means. Because I'm sorry, there, just to elaborate, education of both sides? Um, well, I think the, the IT side gets an education by going through the project, but the business, I think, needs to be educated ahead of the project. Um, what's a, what is a PCM? What does that mean? Why is the taxonomy important? Right. Where is this information going? And, and how, what does that mean to me? So uh, how am I going to appear in the B2B navigation? How is that information going to be exported to a retailer like Home Depot? Um, th that's what means something to the product manager. We, you know, in the, in the early stages of the project, we had them in meetings to review a taxonomy on a spreadsheet. And, you know, it was hard for me to look at. It's very dry to look at. They just had no idea what they were there. And they would say yes to anything just to get out of the meeting. <laughs> so, um, but then eventually that, that comes back, you know, when you implement that and they say, why can't I find this? Or where is this attribute? Why am I in a category with a tool that I don't think belongs in this category? They become very personal opinions. Uh, you know, they're managing this category. They're thinking about how they go to market, not necessarily how we would put that information in a system to manage. So those breaking down some of those barriers early on in the project or just through education would be a really big help. But you're still going to make mistakes. How reliant are you then on the customer versus your internal team on finding those mistakes and fixing them up? I think it's been um, a process of managing exceptions. So as we've loaded the data and things like that, I always get positive updates from our integration partner and my team. What I really just want to know are how many exceptions kicked out. Uh, the rule that we created to map one to the other, how many things are we going to have to address manually? So I'd say, um, you know, I've learned this, this uh, term, we're a skew intensive company. So I didn't call us that before this project. Uh, so that's the language I've learned or vocabulary that I've, uh, you know, learned through the project. And look for an integration partner that's had experience in a skew intensive company. It's very different from taking a B2C retailer live where you may have 100 or 200 SKUs. You could get in, in a meeting room with a spreadsheet and get that solved in a day or two. Right. When you have 20,000 SKUs spread across a distributed group of product managers, that problem cannot be solved uh, quickly. Wow. Susie. I think uh, one of the challenges around that that we've had, and it goes directly back to this morning's um, presentation, is really to get product managers, or IT personnel, sorry, to think about the customer um, and where it makes sense for them to find these products. Because, you know, you, you're a product development organization. You start thinking very uh, in, internally, and it's, it's a constant struggle because, in many ways, the e-business side or the, the web side of things forces us to constantly think that way. But the rest of the organization doesn't always. You're giving us some great guidance. You're also uh, showing us where it can get very difficult, very time consuming. Would you each share with us what's great about being so immersed in B2B e-commerce? Where, where's the value? What value has it brought to your businesses? Maybe each of you share with me one element of value that makes you proud to be who you are. Brian. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the benefits that we saw was a, uh, when we launched in Europe was a very basic order to cash report that we were able to run daily. End to end, these are the orders that came in by the cutoffs and when they shipped. And it was, it was just very useful and it's been very helpful to really understand where we're having issues. Uh, it's humbling to see your si supply chain like that. Uh, and to see where your challenges are on the product side or on the customer side. But having that end-to-end -end picture has been very helpful for us. Excellent. Before I release the microphone from you, anything you'd do differently if you were starting all over again? I think the, and we've touched on it, I think, a little bit, we look at this project much more, and it's really beyond a project, it's, it's a business transformation. You know, it's an opportunity to look more horizontal than vertical at who you are and what you do. You will be changing policies. You will be changing processes. So get everybody in the room and get over it and get going. Nice. Thank you very much indeed. Mark, where's the value? Start with that. I'd say with the challenges of so many SKUs, I see the, the real large value and when you can get that right. And we've seen this as we're going through UAT. The ability for search and browse to be more cons consumer-like has really opened the eyes of, of the business. They had just always looked at 
um, a B2B website as something that's really ugly, really difficult to use, um, very internally focused, and I can see a lot of um, ownership and buy-in from the top level of leadership and that we've sort of put on the front of our, our back-end systems what they want the customer to perceive that we are. And so I think there's going to be um, you know, a doubling down if we can get the system up and running as to what this can do and, and we'll leapfrog our competitors because we do have competition in that B2B space and our top level leadership definitely pays attention to that. Yeah, and if you had your time over, anything you do different with the process of getting to where you are now? Um, we've been very happy with the B2B e-commerce part of the project. The, the PCM side has had its challenges. Um, I could kind of think possibly about splitting them, but maybe the way you go for funding, which is was a challenge for us to, to have it in one project made more sense for the way that we got capital approved. But I would probably force my integration partner to go live with PCM first um, because it really will determine your project dates and the cost of those dates for B2B. If you, if you don't have the product data, then anything you're doing for B2B is really just kind of putting your thumb up in the air and saying, when the product data gets underneath of all this, then it should work. And that's sort of where we've been at the end of our project is, is kind of changing some of the data underneath, which changes the foundation and, and creates issues. Thank you very much. Jeremy, it's over to you. So where's the value? Sure. So in terms of B2B, I think uh, I'm most proud of some of the back office efficiencies we've built, things like automation around returns or price protection that years ago would take man days to complete nice. manually. We've automated those now. So they're very, from a customer perspective, it's very seamless. So we're really proud of that. Um, in terms of what we would do differently, um, thinking back several years, uh, really probably partner more closely with other application groups in terms of ERP functionality. Um, early on, we did a lot of duplication of effort. We built tooling in the front end that could have been replicated in the ERP or vice versa. Mm -hmm. We're better now, but I think that led to a bit of inefficiency in our early days. Understood. Great. Thank you. Susie? I think in terms of what I'm most proud of, um, I think that it's just the as I think Steve mentioned, it's kind of like a hammer to get other things done. Um, this project has really been a big change agent for the whole organization to think differently. So um, that's fun to be ahead of. I came from the days of late 1990s where it was like, honey, do you really think anyone's going to look at that on the computer? <laughs> um, so it's, it's fun. I think the challenges are uh, definitely around the global aspect of what I'm I'm responsible for yeah. um, the languages and sort of where do we go next? A big challenges. Would you do anything differently though? Um, probably a lot of things, but I think the biggest thing that um, I would do differently is make sure that um, aside from having permission to go and do what I need to do, um, which is really what it what it the situation is, um, I would really like more. Uh, engagement um, with the entire organization to help me understand how can digital help enable what they need. Right. That is a two-way street. Susie, thank you very much. Scott Wheeler, it looks as though you're going to get the last word here. Yeah. I mean, Where's the value? For us, it was easy. Uh, our whole business model is around, and, and we actually talk about it, giving employees a better way to buy, which is a reference to they can pay over 12 months through payroll deduction. So. A lot, of the, a lot of the end customers, you know, we go through an employer to get to an employee, and a lot of the end customers are buying things that they wouldn't be able to afford otherwise. Right. So for us, you know, expanding that catalog mm. and giving them access to, to goods and services that they couldn't get otherwise, that was the value. It's great. It's a huge win. And finally, would you do anything differently? Uh, probably, and it's been said a number of times, really get, get the business engagement much higher. I mean, we started out the project and, and you know, I, I even coined it. I'm like, guys, this is not an IT project. This is a business project. Here. Yes. Uh, still, not enough. So we would, you know, doing it again, we'd push a lot harder on the ownership aspect from a business standpoint. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, audience, thank you for all of your questions. And a huge thank you to our panel who've been there, seen it, done it, and now shared the ideas as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>